all stories of traffic jams, frustrated drivers, and empty bike lanes. Changing lanes, the government makes a move to restrict bicycle-only routes in the province. Today, the effort to get traffic moving, the plan that could put the brakes on new bike lanes. Good afternoon. Ontario Transportation Minister says the current process to install bike lanes is out of control. Today, he announced a plan that would require cities get government approval before removing traffic lanes to make way for bikes. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris joins us live with the specific Siobhan. We're on a stretch of blur right now where bike lanes have become a really difficult issue. They've divided neighbors, caused a lot of frustration, intimidation, anger in the neighborhood. What we are hearing from neighbors is that they don't feel that these bike lanes are being very well used. And in turn, the traffic for drivers has been backing up. Uh, their commutes home getting longer and longer by the day. We know that the mayor has acknowledged that there is something wrong with these bike lanes in particular. But we heard the transportation minister say today officially that he doesn't want what happened in this neighborhood to be replicated across the province. So making official today that next week, the Minister of Transportation, Pramit Sarkaria, will introduce legislation that will require cities across the province to come to the province with proof that bike lanes won't interrupt traffic, won't slow down cars if they are to be implemented. Also part of this legislation is the government wants to see data of bike lanes that have been added in the last five years to understand what kind of impact they are having. Of course, these lanes along Bloor Street would fall into that category. This doesn't mean the lanes here are being removed, but it certainly paves the way for that possibility. Something we heard from community advocates today, something they say is a good first step. There were a series of other announcements from the Minister of Transportation. A little aside from bike lanes today, he is working with municipalities to come up with a pothole repair program that should be in place for the start of the construction season at the start of 2025. The idea here is that we know that these potholes can really slow down traffic. They can cause accidents, damage your vehicle if you're unlucky enough to pass over one of the big ones. And so they want to try to get ahead of that problem. We know municipalities have said they spend a lot of money, a lot of time repairing those potholes. Last week, we also heard from the transportation minister about a move to increase speed limits on more stretches of highway where it's safe to do so. We could be going even faster on Ontario highways in the future. Looking at designs of new highways, so think the 413, the Bradford Bypass, potentially that tunnel under the 401. The government's looking at how we can design those highways to accommodate speed limits higher than 120 kilometers an hour. The government's also moving to keep in place to further freeze the fees that you pay when you go take a driver's test. That, again, is acknowledging the rising cost of living. So we heard the minister talk about all the money that Ontarians will save when they get behind the wheel. Overall, though, this bundle of measures meant to keep drivers here in Toronto and across the province moving, get them to their destinations faster. Here's more of what we heard from the minister today. I think ultimately there's absolutely room for, uh, for bike lanes across uh, this the city and across this province. And we need to do so, uh, not uh, ripping up uh, two major uh, lanes of, uh, that are used by vehicles, 25,000 plus, for example, on this uh, on this street. Uh, I think we have to have a reasonable approach to it, and which uh, considers um, all, all road users and, and uh, really tackling the issue uh, of congestion that we are seeing in Toronto. People are suffering just from like a basic human element. They're suffering. Like people that are disabled, they can't they can't access businesses properly. Business owners are suffering. They're down because of accessibility. Now, again, all of those bundle of measures will be introduced on, in legislation coming on the first day that MPPs are back at Queen's Park. That's next Monday. Reporting live, I'm Siobhan Morris. Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you, Siobhan. Meantime, the Premier is promising to enhance the province's biomanufacturing capacity. Unlock new streams of capital that help entrepreneurs turn their ideas into prototypes, into market-ready products. To improve the adoption and uptake of Ontario-made technologies in clinical settings and to continue to solidify our province as a premier destination for life sciences investments. Speaking at a MedTech conference at the Metro Toronto Convention Centre, the Premier pledged to launch the next phase of the government's life sciences strategy. It also includes $146 million in funding. During his remarks, the Premier said he would advocate for faster drug approvals. 
Learning more today about a deadly shooting in an apartment stairwell in the city's north end last week. Police have identified the victim as they appeal for witnesses to come forward. CTV's Beth McDonnell joins us live with all the details. Beth. Nathan, Toronto police are appealing to the public's help to help solve the homicide investigation of Marvin Ba. The 26-year-old student was visiting a building on Clearview Heights. That's near Black Creek and Trethui on October 7th. Police believe around 8 that night, Ba was shot in a stairwell. People called 911 and Ba was found at the back of the building. He was rushed to hospital but did not survive. Police believe there were many people in in the parking lot near where Ba was found and many people who are aware of what happened to him. Detectives hope to bring justice to Ba's killing and they say despite working on the case ever since it happened, few have come forward with information. And there are very few witnesses who have come forward. There's also minimal video coverage in that area. So at this point, I do not have any information with regard to suspects to share. And I also don't have any confirmation about any individuals who were driving vehicles at the time who may have been involved. What I can tell you from the forensic examination of the scene, as well as the minimal witness information I've received at this point, is that I believe that Mr. Ba was shot in the rear stairwell of 83 Clearview Heights. He ultimately came to rest in the parking lot outside of there. But what I know for certain, based on the minimal video that I do have, is that there were many people in that parking lot. There are many people in our city who are aware of what happened to Mr. Ba. And at this point, I'm asking, I'm appealing to witnesses in our city, not only for my homicide investigation, but for Mr. Ba and Mr. Ba's family, to come forward, contact us, do the right thing, and let us know what happened to Mr. Ba in that stairwell. Police say Ba loved his family, they, he loved his friends, and police say anyone that is feeling nervous about their safety or revealing their identity is urged to call Crime Stoppers. Reporting live, I'm Beth McDonnell. Michelle, Nathan, back to you. Thank you, Beth. One person was seriously injured in an overnight stabbing in Scarborough. It happened near Eglinton and Midland Avenues just before 2.30 this morning. Police say a man in his 60s was found with stab wounds and was taken to hospital with serious but non-life-threatening injuries. Police have not released any information on possible suspects. And Hamilton police are on hand at two high schools days after a fatal crash they believe was the result of escalating incidents between students. Police say they're present at St. John de Burbuff and Nora Francis Henderson Secondary School is to help maintain a secure environment and address concerns. A 15-year-old boy died when a Toyota SUV crashed on the Lincoln Alexander Parkway on Friday. Investigators have learned the Toyota was earlier chased by a black Ford Focus and Silver Infinity in the parking lot at Burbuff School. An 18-year-old has been charged with dangerous driving causing death. But police are still looking for the Silver Infinity and advising the driver to turn himself in. And some scary moments this morning in Brampton when a vehicle struck a nuclear waste container. This incident took place at Van Kirk Drive and Regan Road. Crews were advised to stay away from the leaking radiation equipment while fire services investigated. Peel Regional Police have determined there is no risk to the public and roads have reopened. Still to come this noon hour, the power of a pop star. Taylor Swift is set to perform six shows in Toronto next month. Just how much money is expected to be generated when she's here? But first, a live look outside on this Tuesday afternoon. Beautiful, bright sunshine to enjoy, but don't let it fool you. The temperature is brisk. You'll definitely want to dress for a single-digit high today. Let's bring in Jessica Smith with a look at the current conditions. Jess, I was pulling out the hats and mitts this morning. I'm just, I put on my winter coat this morning. I have no shame. I do not like to be cold. And it was just three degrees if you were up around 6 or 7 a.m. and getting the kids off to school. It was definitely chilly out there. We have a northwesterly wind. We have a little cloud cover on the way, so it will feel very fall-like as we head into the afternoon. Now, we're holding on to some pretty gusty winds as well right now, sustained just under 30 kilometers an hour, but gusts close to 40, and that's what we're dealing with throughout almost the entire day, so it is going to feel fresh as we make our way through our Tuesday afternoon. Temperature-wise, we are in the single digits. It is not warm. <laughs> we're below seasonal as we kick off this short work and school week. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long-range forecast, and we'll kind of break down what you can expect as you head through 
throughout the rest of your day and the week ahead. It does get warmer, spoiler alert, but we'll kind of break it all down in a few minutes right now. Let's back over to Michelle and Nathan. Thank you, Jess. Canada's inflation rate registered the smallest yearly increase since February of 2021 last month. It rose by 1.6 percent on a year-over-year -year basis. That was a big drop from the 2 percent bump in August. The main contributor to the deceleration was lower gas prices. They were down more than 10 percent from last year. But Canadians do continue to feel the impact at the grocery store, with prices rising by 2.4 percent. BNN Bloomberg's Paul Bagnall had this assessment of these latest numbers. The headline rate of inflation is now below the Bank of Canada's target of 2.0 percent. Core inflation is a bit of a different story, and I'll get uh, to that in a second. And economists and traders are becoming more confident that the Bank of Canada will cut its rates, uh, its benchmark interest rate again this year, perhaps by as much as half a percentage point next week. And I'll get uh, to that in a, uh, in a second uh, as, as well. So, so all of that is good news for uh, Canadians who have been hit by uh, escalating prices uh, 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 for the things they purchase and for uh, borrowers, particularly holders of variable rate mortgages, because those are the type of mortgages which are affected by uh, interest Interest rates set by the Bank of Canada. The, um, the mechanism is that the bank makes a change to its overnight rate. The big uh, lenders in Canada and smaller lenders as well adjust down their prime rates and uh, the variable rate mortgages and other loans like lines of credit and auto loans are based on those uh, prime rates. The September inflation rate for Toronto was 2.4 percent and it was 1.9 percent in Ontario. Tensions between Canada and India have worsened again following a stunning revelation by the RCMP. Canada's National Police Force says it has evidence linking Indian government officials to violent acts committed against members of this country's Southeast Asian community. The response of the Indian government has been to deny, to obfuscate, to attack me personally and the integrity of the government of Canada and its officials and its police agencies. And we have simply said we're going to allow our agencies to do the work, particularly to move from intelligence collection from agencies to police investigations that result in arrests, trials and consequences within a rigorous and robust and independent judicial system. We will also urge Canada to ban the RSS which is a right-wing extremist militant group from India that has branches in other countries, including in Canada, that promotes violence and division. We'll also urge Canada to impose severe and strict sanctions on Indian diplomats. We need to take every step possible to keep Canadians safe. The RCMP has exposed a very serious threat, and now let's take that threat seriously and act accordingly. The RCMP's charged eight people in relation to murder investigations and 22 others in extortion cases. In the last year, they've also warned more than a dozen people in Canada connected to the Sikh separatist movement about credible threats to their lives. Canada has told six Indian officials to leave the country. India has denied the allegations and expelled six Canadian officials. And for more on this, we're joined by CTV's Scott Hurst. Scott, can you bring us up to date on the diplomatic role between India and Canada. Nathan, we heard from Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie at that press conference with the Prime Minister and other top Canadian officials that this country is not seeking a diplomatic confrontation with India, but with these uh, latest stunning allegations, it sure puts the two sides at odds, and these odds have been uh, getting worse for quite some time. The RCMP is alleging Indian diplomats and consular officials based in Canada engaged in clandestine activities linked to serious criminal activity in this country. The stunning allegations are being made public as the Canadian government announces it is expelling six Indian diplomats as the RCMP has identified them as persons of interest in the murder of a Sikh activist in British Columbia last year. Now, this is putting the relationship between India and Canada at what many are calling an all-time low. 
the diplomatic standoff halting any progress in the relationship and really sending shockwaves through any other political or financial ties between the two countries. The RCMP commissioner going on to say that Indian diplomats and consular officials based in Canada leveraged their official position to engage in those clandestine activities. Here's more from the former CSIS director on the current relationship between Canada and India and where it goes from here. I think it's very serious. Um, the Canadian government has really been left with no option uh, by the by the Indians, uh, assuming the information that the RCMP has released is accurate, and I have no reason to think it's not. Uh, they seem to have chapter and verse. Uh, so uh, this is likely to go on for some time, and it's really very difficult to see how uh, it can be uh, um, ameliorated given the position of the Indians, unless the Indians back off. Uh, this is likely to go on for a, quite a long time. And Nathan, as you mentioned, India has rejected the allegations accusing Canada of, quote, smearing India for political gains and in retaliation ordering six Canadian diplomats to leave the country within a week. So how did this all start? Well, this stunning rift really went public last year after the Prime Minister uh, stood up in the House of Commons and accused the Indian government of being involved in the killing of Hardeep Singh Nijjar, a prominent Sikh independence activist who was shot and killed outside a British Columbia Gurdwara just in Surrey, B.C., right outside of Vancouver in June of last year. Najjar is an Indian-born Canadian citizen who is a leader of the pro-Khalistan movement to push for a proposed independent Sikh homeland, which is strongly opposed by India and banned in that country. Since then, there have been several diplomatic exchanges that have continued to rupture the relationship. And now this latest escalation putting the two sides at odds that many experts say is the worst it's been in quite some time or potentially at an all-time low, Nathan. All right, CTV, Scott Hurst, thank you. Thanks, Nathan. And a day after those RCMP allegations, Canada's public safety minister is expected to testify before the federal inquiry into foreign interference. Dominique Leblanc says he doesn't think it's necessary to expand the inquiry's mandate to include some of the new allegations. He says the inquiry is already dealing with India's foreign interference activities in Canada and is confident the commissioner's report will deal with the allegations. The prime minister's chief of staff, Katie Telford, is also testifying today. Justin Trudeau will appear before the commission tomorrow. The latest round of carbon pricing rebates will land in Ontario bank accounts today. This is the first time all banks will label the payment as the Canada carbon rebate. The Liberals are defending the policy against increasing criticism from opposition parties. The quarterly rebate will go to residents to help offset what people pay in carbon pricing. The rebates are not available in British Columbia, Quebec and all three territories. Back here at home, Toronto is preparing for a major boon to the local economy thanks to one of the world's biggest pop stars. Taylor Swift is set to perform six shows at the Rogers Centre next month. And today we're getting a sense of the kind of money that will be generated while she is here. CTV's Raheem Ladani joins us live with more details. Raheem, she's a force of nature causing seismic activity with her concerts and, uh, and a flood of funds. Yeah, she certainly is, Michelle. I mean, you know, when there's a, a big event here in the city of Toronto, there's always an economic impact, whether it's a concert, TIFF, or the Caribbean Carnival. But we haven't really seen anything like this to this magnitude. And that, of course, is the Taylor Swift effect. Welcome to the Eras Tour. In less than a month, Taylor Swift will descend upon Toronto for six shows. And along with her Swifties comes hundreds of millions of dollars for the city. The visitors that come to the concerts will spend about $152 million. In but the economic boost doesn't stop there. Destination Toronto estimates Swift's lasting impact will continue to grow to $282 million. It draws people into the city. It draws new spending into the city. That's money that didn't start the day in our economy, but it ends the day there and then continues to circulate, paying wages, paying taxes and supporting businesses all throughout the city. These figures do not include the price for concert tickets or airfare from out-of-town visitors because those dollars don't generally stay within the economy. They are taking into account hotels, dining out, shopping, local transportation and entertainment. In fact, it's also estimated that $40 million in tax revenue will be generated by all levels of government. And I can't wait until she comes here and drives economic growth. Like I said, she's a brilliant business person and a musician. And uh, boy, 
excuse the pun, but what a rock star she is coming here Thank and creating so more jobs. And it all begins with Swift's first Toronto concert on November 14th. Now, to give you an even greater sense of how busy the city is going to get in less than a month's time, at the end of September, hotel bookings in the downtown core were up 83%, and across the city, they were up 36%. Reporting live, I'm Raheem Ladani. I'll send it back to you, all three of you, in the studio. As we kind of get into the short work and school week, we're holding on to a daytime high a little below seasonal. So if you like the cooler weather, today is your day. We're looking at just kind of in that 10, 9 to 10 degree range, so sitting a little below seasonal. And it'll stay quite windy out there with a northwesterly wind with gusts upwards of 40 kilometers an hour. So it is fresh. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long range forecast, including a bit of a warm up on the way. All those details right after the break. The especially warm weather in recent months likely means we won't see as many vibrant fall colors this season. Experts at McMaster University say the weather that's most likely to prompt bright colors in the fall is a mix of sunny and cold conditions. And while weather temperatures have dropped recently, biology professor Susan Dudley said it might be too late for the physiological process that triggers trees to change their colors. Although I'm looking at what looks like pretty bright colors. In fact, on the drive-in, yeah. I was noticing it on the DVP. You see all the trees and all the, the colors, and it looks great. Mm -hmm. I think it looks wonderful. It's my favorite time of the year to get stuck in traffic because the trees are so pretty on the DVP. <laughs> Only that time, though. Yes. It is <laughs> It is cooler, though. If you were up early this morning, I know we talked about this before, it was freezing. I say freezing, it's relatively speaking, but it was only about three degrees early on. So you were kind of thinking, do I need the hat? Do I need the gloves? Do I need the winter coat? Probably. But the good news is it gets warmer as we head throughout the week. Well, there is brought to you by the Presler Law Firm. Injury lawyers, you don't pay unless they win. Now, a beautiful sunny start to the day, albeit a cold one. So if you were up early on to see the sunrise, you got to capture all this chilly glory. And as we head throughout the rest of our day, we're looking at a northwesterly wind keeping us chilly as we make our way into the afternoon. But the good news is it only gets warmer from here. And as we head into the weekend, we are looking close to 20 degrees so we go from below seasonal to above but for now it is a little fresh we're sitting at just eight here in the city we're holding on to just one through some areas in northern ontario and that continues right throughout the day into this afternoon we'll sit around 10 the seasonal norm is 13 so we're not far off uh, but it'll be windy I just want to like, get you to focus on the fact that there is the potential of some snow towards Peterborough and Bancroft, potentially the first of the year. Nowhere near us, but it's always fun to talk about, right? As we head in towards the end of our day today, we'll be very seasonal, sitting right around four degrees, but it's fresh out there. We're holding on to those single digit lows as we really step in towards a good portion of the week ahead. We're looking at a very unsettled day. Nothing super serious as far as an organized system, but it does remain unsettled thanks to a few troughs in the area set to bring showers around the GT but we're likely to stay relatively dry, just mostly cloudy as we head in towards the afternoon. We're looking at the potential of a little freezing rain in towards Kitchener and through the Waterloo region, but for, or through Waterloo region, pardon me, but we are holding on to just mostly cloudy conditions for us here in the city and through a good portion of the GTA. We could see a few light passing showers into the early evening, but relatively speaking, we're just holding on to a whole lot of cloud cover and cooler temperatures. As we head in towards our Wednesday, we'll start to see some of this stuff start to clear up just a little bit. And then high pressure really does settle in quite nicely as we step in towards the end of the week. And by the weekend not that I'm wishing away the week that we're in but it gets really nice temperature wise so something to look forward to as we step in towards the end of the short work and school week temperature wise again we're a little below seasonal as we head throughout the day today and into our Wednesday but from Thursday onwards we start to do that slow but steady climb back up above seasonal 14 as we head through our Thursday through Friday Saturday Sunday between about 17 and 18 degrees and it's going to remain above seasonal as we step in towards really almost the end of the month. So kind of looking ahead and thinking ahead to Halloween for the trick-or-treaters. I'm watching that forecast really closely, but overall we're kind of doing a slow but steady uh, increase in our temperatures. So that will change the wind direction. High pressure settles in, making for a fantastic forecast. Yes, it's a little fresh today, tomorrow, but we are in towards the middle of October, so it is typical for this time of year. Nathan, Michelle, I'll send things back over to you. Thank you, Jess. Thanks. Crews in Florida are making progress, restoring power in the wake of Hurricane Milton. But overall, a lot of people have was worse off than we are, so we're very fortunate on that. Almost a week after landfall, power has been restored to most areas in the state. 
As of this morning, there were about 190,000 customers still off the grid. Most school districts in the hardest hit areas are planning to resume classes tomorrow. Milton has been linked to more than a dozen deaths in Florida. Still to come on CTV News at noon, separating students from their cell phones. It was a major change in the classroom this year. Are the new school phone policies a success? We check in with students and teachers. Students across the country are now well into the school year, one that has disconnected kids from their cell phones while in class. But as CTV Sarah Plowman reports, it appears many teachers and students are already giving the new rules a passing grade. A new school year rang in new rules around cell phones. The bans differ across jurisdictions, but the aim is the same. Cut cell phone use out of class. One month in, so far, so good. The, the feedback that we've been getting from teachers and administrators and school communities is that it's been very positive. That report card from New Brunswick's teachers echoes what's being said in Alberta. They are surprised that they haven't seen the pushback that they were anticipating to happen. Teachers had worried about policing the new policy. But students have been really respectful of it. Instead, another pattern emerged. Generally, I have noticed more focus and less distractions among my students. But what do students think? I feel like it's a lot more social in some classes. Like, people are talking directly to each other, not just scrolling on their phones a lot more. In some classrooms, phones are kept in backpacks. In others, they're put in a pouch like this. I've only seen a couple people put burner phones in there, and that's going to, like, pretty, pretty extreme lengths to do that. But some people just put their case in there, and teachers don't notice. Students say the majority of their peers follow the rules, even if some don't. I am surprised because at the start of the year, I really didn't think it was going to work. And as a result... Um, the classroom is very different because I find more people are paying attention in class more. And seemingly paying more attention to each other. Sarah Plowman, CTV News, Fredericton. Curiosity is a fundamental part of human nature, but have you ever wondered whether curiosity changes as we get older? Researchers in the UK have found that younger people tend to sprinkle their attention widely across more topics, while older people dig deeper into fewer topics. For more, let's bring in CTV and science and tech specialist Dan Riskin. Dan, are you there? Yay, there you are. How cool is this? Researchers curious about curiosity. Tell us about their experiment. Yeah, very meta. I, I, I really like this. I'm curious about what they would find as well. And this is something they set up at a science center in London, England. And basically, people would come in and they had a bunch of topics. And this was for an experiment. You were told, OK, you've got these stacks of facts. And uh, pick a topic. It could be mythical creatures, could be uh, paleontology, it could be rocks, whatever. You pick your stack and then you learn a fact. And then you have a choice about going deeper on that fact and learning another one about the same topic. or going over and starting on a new topic. And they had people of all ages do this. And what they found is young people go down a little bit and then they move over and start on something else, move over, start on something else. And people that are older tend to really drill in. Once they pick a topic, they just keep going until they get to the bottom of the stack. And this fundamental difference, I think, is really telling because sometimes I watch, you know, kids with their grandparents in a place like the Science Center or the zoo and you look at how they're, you know, kids are always looking for something new and, and dividing their attention across a wide range of things. And sometimes the grandparents are like, can't we just stay and focus on this for a second just so I can satisfy my curiosity? So it's, it's neat because it gives me insight into some family dynamics that I've seen play out. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen those too, Dan. Uh, let's get to your next story, which has a, a Halloween feel to it. This is an economic study about what are called phantom costs. What are those? This is great. This is when there isn't really a cost, but you act like there is. And so a perfect example is, let's say you're walking down the street and somebody says, do you want a free cookie? And you say, sure. Then they say, or, or how about on a different day, you walk down the street and someone says, I will pay you $20 if you eat this cookie. Now, a cookie plus $20 is a better deal, but you'd be pretty suspicious about why somebody's paying you $20 to eat that cookie, right? And so that's called a phantom cost. And there's this new paper looking at a whole bunch of different domains, like you know the flight, uh, the price of flights, or how much you want to be paid per hour to drive a truck, or whether you'd take the free cookie, or whether you'd hold a door open for someone. In every case, they found a way to make the deal just way too sweet, and people back away. They freak out. They think there's got to be some kind of hidden cost, some kind of phantom cost 
that I don't know about. And so uh, they, you know, the researchers are saying if you're somebody that's trying to give away samples, you need to be wary of this. I think it's super interesting because it shows that when you're curious about what that that trick might be, you you behave accordingly, and our curiosity sort of protects us from making a fatal mistake. Mm -hmm. I think we've been burned too before, right? And with all the scams out there, it's like mm. I don't want anything free. Just leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If it seems too good to be true, it probably isn't it true. Probably is. Let's get to this uh, final story, which is based on an email that you got from someone who runs a haunted house in Windsor, and they wrote that they've obtained a special light. This sounds so cool that it makes everything seem black and white, like in the old days in the movies, and wanted to know how it works. What did you find yeah. out? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, I love this when somebody, they'd seen me, you know, on the news talking about science, they said, here's somebody that's going to figure this out for us. So it's called a low sodium light, and they used to be in street lights in the 90s. They have that sort of yellow color. But what's funny about them is they only give off light at a very narrow band of wavelength. So in normal light, you know, the, the rose, you can see that it's red on a background. But here, when the other light comes on, it looks like it's just black and white. And it, it is orange and black. I mean, it's not black and white, but it's orange and black. But nonetheless, there's no color whatsoever. And so you're used to having no color when you're in dim light. But when it's well lit and there's no color, it tends to have kind of a freaky feel to it. And it's because there's only one wavelength. So it's not that there's no color, it's that there's only one color. And so things can't reflect different wavelengths to look like they're different colors. There's only one wavelength to work with, and that's why it looks black and white. Mm, question answered. Dan, I hope that viewer is watching right now. Hope you're satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they are. I hope they are. CTV science and tech expert Dan Riskin, appreciate it. Always fun to chat. Thanks so much. Evil Dead, the musical, has returned to Toronto, and a new block of tickets has been released, including a special Halloween performance. The Canadian show, based on the popular film trilogy, has since become a worldwide phenomenon. CTV's Andrea Kay spoke with some of the cast members on what drew them to the production. <laughs> When your stage show is based on a popular film trilogy and your cast album debuts at number four on the Billboard show charts, you have a built-in audience. And that's the case with Evil Dead, the musical. Actor Aaron Robinson. It's a lot like Rocky Horror. I think that's one of the biggest appeals of this show is the fact that it is unlike any other musical. Um, this is a show that because of its ties to the film franchise, the Evil Dead trilogy, you know, people love these films. Um, and because of that, this musical attracts a crowd of folks who might not often find themselves seeing a musical, which is very exciting to have the opportunity to expose people to, to, to musical theater. Created by Queen's University grads in 2003, actor Pascal Berman was familiar with the show even before she auditioned for it. I went to Queen's University and as did many of the creators so it was sort of talked about in school as like someday you could do something great like Evil Dead the Musical. Now she is. An off-Broadway hit, the show which opened last week at the Randolph Theatre has already been extended here in Toronto. Don't be alarmed by the blood on Robinson. He says it has a minty flavor. It isn't scary at all. Uh, even it's not scary. I promise. It's not scary at all. It's, it is gut-bustingly funny. It's like a laugh a minute. Actually, not, not a laugh a minute, more like a laugh a second. Um, yeah, it's fun for, for all ages. Uh, the crowds are cackling out here. Sometimes I can't hear the other actors on stage because the laughter is too loud. And many people taking in the show have an emotional attachment to it, even showing up in costume. A lot of people will um, wear their old wedding dresses if they're divorced, perhaps, and they'll sit in the front row and they'll get it covered in blood. <laughs> and I've heard of people who they go home and they instantly throw it in the dryer because they want to lock in the stains. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, it does come out very easily, mm -hmm. I promise. People have a real emotional attachment, too, and people come in full costume. Andrea Case, CTV News. Pop star Olivia Rodrigo had a hard landing during a concert in Australia. Uh, you can hear that collective gasp from the audience in Melbourne when Rodrigo fell through the stage. The 21-year-old quickly bounced back up, continued her performance as part of her Guts World Tour. She's okay. Still to come, the expense of being entertained through streaming services. Get ready to pay more for Spotify. What's behind the rising rates? 
An important part of any household's fire prevention plan is to make sure smoke detectors are in working order. Fire officials say three out of every five fire deaths happen in homes with either no smoke alarms or ones that weren't functioning because of dead batteries. Here's Pat Foran and Consumer Alert. It's a sound you don't want to hear. Simon Glensick and his family were lucky to make it out of their home after a dryer caught fire. Smoke is like white smoke billowing out of the dry area. It just went so fast. It's just still mind boggling, boggles my mind. Consumer Reports says that today many house fires burn faster, hotter, and are deadlier than ever. 40 years ago, you would have had 17 minutes to get out of a house on fire. Today, just three. That's because many newer homes have open floor plans with fewer walls and doors, allowing the fire to travel faster and more freely. Another factor. A lot of homes today have furnishings made with synthetic materials like plastic and particle board, which burn much quicker than, say, solid wood. Toronto Fire Services agrees that fires are burning faster due to the materials in new home construction and furniture being more flammable. What happens in a fire is that it ignites very quickly, burns through very quickly, and we're seeing um, homes collapse almost instantly in a fire because of it. It's why having an early fire warning and getting out is more important than ever. A smoke detector should be installed on each floor and tested once a month and replaced after 10 years. Batteries should be changed each spring and fall when you turn your clocks forward or back with daylight savings time. So if you have that early warning device, you know right away when there's smoke from combustion and it buys you that extra time to get yourself safely out of the fire. You should also discuss a home fire escape plan with your family with at least two planned points of exit in case of a fire. Toronto Fire Services says their biggest concern now is fires involving lithium-ion batteries. The batteries used in e-bikes, laptops and cell phones always use the proper charger with these batteries and don't leave them charging unattended. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. The Public Health Agency of Canada says a listeria outbreak linked to several plant-based milks appears to be over. There have been no additional cases reported since August, and the agency says its investigation is now complete. Listeria was found within the production environment of silk and great value plant-based refrigerated beverages. The last tally of cases on August 12th remains unchanged. There were three deaths and 20 confirmed infections in Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia and Alberta. A national recall was issued of several of the products with October 4th as the latest best before date. Oil prices plunged today. Andrew Bell of B&M Bloomberg brings us the latest in business. Hello there. Here are your business headlines. North American crude oil dropped more than $3 U.S. to trade just above 70 bucks a barrel. That's after the Washington Post said Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has told the U.S. he's willing to strike military rather than oil or nuclear facilities in Iran in retaliation for missile attacks. That may remove a threat to crude supply from the Middle East. Meanwhile, the International Energy Agency says the world will have a glut of oil next year. The Bank of Canada may be set for a big half percentage point reduction in interest rates on Wednesday of next week. Canadian consumer prices last month were up just 1.6% year over year, increasing the chances of a jumbo rate cut. This was the first time since early 2021 that inflation came in below the central bank's 2% target. And finally, tension keeps increasing over which nations can have access to U.S. artificial intelligence technology. Bloomberg says Washington officials have discussed capping sales of advanced AI chips from NVIDIA and other American companies on a country-specific basis. The focus is said to be Persian Gulf countries that have a growing appetite for AI data centers. That's the latest in business. I'm Andrew Bell of BNM Bloomberg. Streaming services are becoming more expensive. Starting in December, Spotify will increase its subscription rates in Canada. This will be the second price increase from the streaming platform in seven months. CTV's Paul Hollingsworth has those details. Spotify is eating into a chunk of Canadian household budgets and now subscription rates are on the rise. 
By the end of the year, individual accounts will go up $1.70 per month before taxes. The duo package is going up by almost $3. Family subscribers will pay an extra $4. Music publicist Eric Alper says this comes at a time when Spotify's business is booming. This is going to be the first year that Spotify actually makes a profit. Alper says music streaming platforms pay lots of money to rights holders and those fees increase each year. Spotify has also expanded its content. Now that they have went into the, the, the podcasting game, that's even more content for them to pay out. So not only are you looking at 120 million songs available, now you're looking at tens of millions of podcasters. According to technology analyst Carmi Levy, this latest cost climb is part of an industry trend and Spotify is not alone. Every year, Spotify and other streaming providers hike their rates to Canadians. In these times of high inflation, Levy says many Canadians are deciding which streaming services they should cancel. It's almost like a frog in a pot of water. You increase the temperature just a little bit uh, at a time. You don't really notice it, but eventually you realize it's really hot. It's time to get out. Economist Moshe Lander calls this a gamble by Spotify that will likely pay off. I would guess that they're probably going to increase the number of subscribers that they have because they're on a very, very uh, strong upward trend. If Spotify adds new customers at a time when they are charging higher fees, experts predict they'll become an even more dominant platform with the ability to squeeze out their competitors. Paul Hollingsworth, CTV News, Halifax. In sports, the Raptors take on the Celtics in a preseason rematch tonight. Toronto fell to the defending NBA champs 115-111 on Sunday. Grady Dick scored a team-high 18 points in the loss. The Raptors are 1-2 and two in preseason action with two more games before the regular season tips off against the Cleveland Cavaliers October 23rd. Tonight's game starts at 7 o'clock. To the soccer pitch, Ed Christine Sinclair will play her final game in Canada tonight. Her Portland Thorns take on the Vancouver Whitecaps girls elite team in Champions Cup play at BC Play Stadium. Sinclair announced last month she would retire from professional soccer at the end of this season. She ended her international career last year as the world's top scorer in both men's and women's soccer with 190 goals. Meantime, the Toronto Maple Leafs gave back to the community this Thanksgiving weekend, serving up a meal to young people at Covenant House. Some players made the annual visit yesterday afternoon, serving up a Thanksgiving feast, as well as distributing gifts and engaging with the youth who live at the shelter. Visitors from the Leafs included Nick Robertson and new players Chris Tanev and Anthony Stolarz. It's a really big deal for us at Covenant House, having members of the Toronto Maple Leafs team here. It really draws attention to, to the issue and awareness of the issue of youth homelessness in our city, which is unfortunately still a big deal. 2,000 young people homeless every night. Um, but, you know, in addition to that, it really makes a statement to the young people that they're not alone. There are people who care about them. And, you know, some of their heroes and idols who play for the Toronto Maple Leafs are here um, to lend some support. Well, obviously, it's uh, a privilege to, to do what we do, but, um, you know, just to be able to, to use our platform and our voice and uh, to be able to help out and, you know, just seeing the smiles on their faces. And, uh, you know, for me, this is really my first time in a, a big Canadian market, but obviously hockey is, uh, you know, such an important part of, uh, of everyone's life. And, uh, you know, any way that we can give back and, you know, kind of brighten someone's day, you know, means a lot to them and means a lot to us as well. Covenant House offers a range of services for hundreds of young people in the city experiencing homelessness. Coming up, blown away by Halloween, the jack-o'-lantern that almost became too much Ooh, for a responding police officer. As we approach Halloween, you may have noticed elaborate displays are taking over homes across the GTA. Mm -hmm. In Ohio, some police officers had their hands full while trying to wrangle a giant inflatable jack-o'-lantern. 
The massive Halloween display was no match for a strong gust of wind. It took up both lanes of a road west of Cleveland, swallowing up the first officer on scene. The Bay Village Police Department says it got a call about the runaway pumpkin over the weekend. Backup officers eventually arrived and it was successfully returned to it. Mm. Just pop it. I would love that call. Right. <laughs> officers, is this giant jack o' lantern? You got to do something. Is it the great pumpkin? What? Yeah. Listen, I. I would love to see it. And luckily, nobody got hurt, and Halloween will still happen. Yeah. Uh, but also, the weather can impact things like that. So when you have these inflatables that look so cool, make sure they're secured properly because a gust of wind could take it away. It is a windy one as we head throughout our afternoon today. So if you do have some of those decorations up, you may want to put an extra anchor down on the ground. But overall, not a bad start to the short work and school week. It's just a little chilly. We're sitting at about 8 degrees now. We've warmed up a little. Uh, sitting about 10 through Windsor and 8 out through Ottawa. Now, as we head throughout the rest of the week, we do warm up ever so slightly. It really isn't, though, until Friday, Saturday, Sunday that we start to see temperatures return to... A little bit more warm. Mm -hmm. Good to hear. Thank you, Jess. And that is CTV News at noon. Remember, you can get Toronto's breaking news all day long on CP24 and at our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jess Smith and the whole team here, have a pleasant afternoon. I'm Michelle Dubay. And I'm Nathan Dowd. Be sure to join us later for CTV News at 5 and 6. Have a great afternoon.